John, the 14th chapter, verse 2. In my Father's house are many mansions. We could stop right there, couldn't we? If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for who? For me. Somebody say me. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. That's his promise. And receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. I want to preach for a little while this morning a message just titled, Heaven on My Mind. Heaven on my mind. Would you lift your hands and thank the Lord for his word. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the promises that you've given us. Help us to gleam for the next few minutes about this place called heaven. In the name of Jesus, thank you for standing. You may be seated. The greatest thing this side of heaven is experiencing salvation. The gift of salvation It's just out of this world. The gift of salvation is the promise from the word of God that God so loved the world that he gave. And oh, how he gives. We experience that gift through repentance and confession of our sins and turning in faith. Somebody say in faith. And crying out to God. Being buried with Jesus in water baptism. And rising to walk in newness of life through the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit. Speaking in other tongues, it's something not unusual. It's part of this new birth experience. The greatest side thing this side of heaven is salvation. Has anybody experienced that in this building today? But we remember as great as salvation is... This is merely the earnest of our inheritance. This is the beginning of the dream. This is the starting place. And what began on earth will continue in heaven. We're on a journey. The old song that says, this world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. Somebody ought to give the Lord a hand clap with anticipation. Heaven is God's greatest unending gift to mortal man. There are movies in this world that that talk about and show places and scenes that seem just out of this world as well, but they are fictional. And but I preach of a world today that which you will never have to come back from and you will never be disappointed in. No post heaven blues. Paul went to heaven and was told to say nothing about it. John went to heaven and was commanded to write about it. What John saw, what Paul saw, what Ezekiel saw, what Isaiah saw defines, uh, defiles imagination, defies imagination. I have not seen, ear has not heard, neither enter into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. Oh, what a glorious hope that we have in Christ Jesus. Amen. This world is found in Revelation 21. And close to the end of the book, John uh, 21, I want to read from here. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. And there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people and God shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There'll be no more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. 
Would you clap your hands and thank him for that hope? Heaven, heaven on my mind. In the country of the blind, H.G. Wells writes, of a tribe in the remote valley in a high mountain range, a terrible sickness, he wrote, strikes the village, and each and all of the villagers lose their sight. Their blindness has passed from generation to generations. Years pass. Eventually, a generation grows up having no awareness of sight or the world that they're able, unable to see. They cease to realize that they are blind, he writes. They don't know their true condition, nor do they understand what their world really looks like or that there is a world beyond their valley. And all of that changes when an intruder came into their valley. Our world is divided into seven seas and seven continents. Nations carve up this world in distinct valleys, but in actuality, all of us are born into the same country. It's the country of the blind. We are born blind. The disease of sin has blinded us to the God of heaven. But God is real, and heaven is real. But only the shadow is witness where we are today. The substance is unseen, but through the eyes of faith, thankfully, there's an intruder, intruder that came into our valley of darkness. His name is Jesus Christ. We were born in sin and shaped in iniquity. We didn't know his ways. We didn't understand his ways, but he came into our life, changed us. I once was blind, or well, maybe not physically blind, but now we see. He tells us how much he loves us. Somebody say it's good to be loved. Would you raise your hand and say, I am loved. He tells us how much he loves us. And then even in our blinded state, we realize that he is God. In him is life. And that life is the light of men. And each one of us experienced the anguish of life. I remember as a young man that, that uh, I didn't know what was happening and uh, the, the, the light rays were like something, like somebody taking a sledgehammer and hitting my head. And at 18 years old, what they diagnosed me with was, uh, was spinal meningitis. And it intensified and intensified. And light was my biggest enemy, it seemed. That long and short, they pushed me into isolation and they gave me everything they could give me and they finally thought that I would pass. But I, I want to tell you that there is something powerful about light. There's something today that is more powerful than darkness. Our world is filled with darkness, but there is a light of God that is shining, and this is our day. This is a day of hope. This is a day of promise. The moment when light hurts our sensitive eyes, and for one painful moment we think of turning from the light. Yet life means more. When the pain passes, we realize that we have entered into the land of joy, unspeakable and full of glory. John was commanded to write about heaven, taken from the Isle of Patmos into the courts of heaven. The postman from from uh, Patmos penned letters to seven churches describing what he saw. He saw the plan of God unfold in the last days. And I do believe that Jesus is coming soon. He saw the rise of the false prophets and he saw the Antichrist. He witnessed the Lord's return to earth and he saw the new Jerusalem coming down from heaven to a new earth. The present heaven is where Jesus is. The present he heaven is that's where the souls of the saved reside. The present heaven is a place that we speak of 
when we're born again, the born again saints of God asleep, go to sleep in a world and awakens in the presence of God. The present heaven is where the souls of men await that great resurrection. I do believe that in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, according to the word of God, God is going to resurrect the people of God from all of our world. When I say heaven, I'm speaking of the heaven that is to come, the abiding, the eternal hope for every saved person. Whether they know where it is or what it is, man, I believe, longs for heaven. Australian Aborigines pictured heaven as a distant island beyond the setting sun. Early Finnish people thought it was an island beyond the rising sun. People all over the world believed that, when, that, when, uh, that, that, that the sun in that day was heaven, or the moon, the land of night, after death would bring heaven. Babylonians' legends refers to a resting place of heroes and speaks of a tree of life. The Romans believed that the righteous would picnic in the Elysian fields. The Egyptians believed that their spirits would follow maps into a future world. Seneca, the Roman philosopher, said, the day that thou fearest as the last is the birthday of eternity. In the Roman catacombs, the places where the bodies of the martyred Christians were buried, inscriptions on those tombs read like this, in Christ, Alexander is not dead, but he lives one who lives with God, he has taken up into his eternal home. Pictures of the catacombs, walls portray heaven with beautiful landscapes, children playing and people feasting. In AD 125, at the height of the Roman persecution, a Greek man wrote to a friend about Christianity, explaining why this new religion seemed to be so successful. He said, if any righteous man among the Christian passes from this world, they rejoice and offer thanks to their God. And they escort his body with songs and thanksgiving as if he were setting out from one place to another nearby. Amen. Christians don't talk much about heaven. We talk about this world as if it was our eternal home. If we're not careful, we invest every thought and every talent and everything that we have in this world. But the writer tells us if we have hope only in this life, that we are of all men most miserable. We are on a journey. We speak of successful techniques for abundantly living. We talk about investments. We talk about our jobs. We talk about the things that we have. And all of those are significant. And I don't want to take any of that away. But I want to tell you, the Bible says the day that we seek him with all of our heart, then we will find him. We need to find Jesus again. America needs to find Jesus again. It seems that the moment matters more than the eternal. From John Calvin onward, Christianity turned its back toward heaven. In its lengthy institutes, Calvin devotes little time to the subject of heaven. Niebuhr's nature and destiny of man, he says nothing about heaven. In Shedd's three-volume systematic theology, 87 pages can be found about eternal punishment. Two pages can be found in his writings about heaven. In his 900-book page, Great Doctrines of the Bible, Lloyd-Jones devotes less than two pages on heaven. Burkhoff's classic systematic theology gives 38 pages to creation, 40 pages on baptism, but only one page on heaven. Page 737. The soul of man lives shortly on this earth, but eternally elsewhere. But only on page 737 that he talks about it. 
even to one without a religious commitment or dedication and theological conviction, it could be unsettling thought that this world is attempting to chart its way through the, some of the most perilous waters in history, having now decided to ignore the certainty of judgment, the longing for heaven, and the dread of hell. Oh, we need to talk more about heaven. Amen. There is something that happens when we begin to understand and have revelation of who we are and where we are going. We want saying, this world is not my home. I said it earlier, but we need to sing it more. I'm just a passing through. A false doctrine came forth some years ago denying the existence of heaven straight from the, 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 the gully of hell. They started teaching the teaching that swept the country. It said that the only heaven we have is spiritual and there's not a literal heaven. They said it's not a real place. And soon people who drank from that vile fountain begin to think less and less about heaven and begin to just believe that earthly heaven and earthly joys was their real heaven. They became overly fixated with the present life. They forgot about the true word of the Lord. Imagine if you're an astronaut. For five years, you prepared for a mission to Mars. And when you're preparing to board the spacecraft, a reporter comes up to you and asks you, so sir, what can you tell us about Mars, about that place that you spent five years preparing for? And you reply, nothing. We've never talked about really that place. We've just been five years preparing. I want you to know today that your children need to know about heaven. Your family members need to talk about heaven. If that is our eternal home, then if all we talk about is this, I want us to anticipate because heaven is really incredible. Inconceivable. If the astronaut said, well, we'll find out when we get there. We just don't know anything about it. Amen. Philip of Macedonia, the father of, father of Alexandria, the great, had a man who did nothing all day long but stand before him and remind him that this world was not his home, that one day he would die. Contrast that with Louis the Fourteenth, who lived in Versailles Palace. He would not allow anyone to speak of death. He had a chapel in the palace, and preachers were never allowed to mention the word death. Amen. Amen. And I guess if you believe that all there is to life is right here and right now, that you can become totally consumed. Amen. But if that's the case, you're missing out on the place that God has prepared for the de redeemed and the joys of heaven. For heaven is the home for our ransomed soul. Amen. The prison cell where Paul is thought to have been imprisoned in Rome was a dark dungeon place to live, but from this cell, Paul is supposed to have written in his present the epistles, the Ephesians, Colossians, Philemon, Philipp, uh, Philippians, and regardless of what Paul could see in that dungeon, he experienced the great joy and hope regardless of what was happening. He rejoiced always, the word says, always in the Lord. From the prison cell, he wrote, wrote words like this, to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. He said, I desire to depart with and be with Christ, which is far better. What are you preaching today, Pastor? I'm saying no matter what you're going through, what valley you're in, what hill you're climbing, what the situation is, there is hope, and you can speak in that dungeon of life, in that depressed state of life and say to live, amen, is to live for Christ. But I live with hope in my heart that all things are going to work together for the good of them that love the Lord. In another moment of absolute transparency, Paul said in 2 Corinthians 6, as long as we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. No, this world is not our home. Heaven is prepared 
for the saints of God. When Marco Polo returned to Italy, he described a world his audience had never seen and seemed so utterly imaginary. China was so far from Italy, but Polo managed to explain it and to compare it and to contrast it with the, his audience that he knew. He had to unwrap the mysteries of China. So today, can we unwrap a little bit about heaven? Can we speak a little about heaven? Can we think a little bit about heaven? Jesus called it my father's house. Just before leaving his disciples, he said, you won't see me for a while, amen, but I'm gonna send my comforter. I'm gonna send my spirit. John 14 and three, if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. That's a promise. And receive you unto myself that where I am, there you may be also. I want you to clap your hands and thank him again. I go to prepare a place for you when you feel alone, when you feel depressed, when you feel like that nobody cares or nobody sees, Jesus has already been preparing a place for you and you have hope in him. Amen. Heaven is a place prepared with you in mind. I've got the greatest wife in the world. and Yeah, you know that. But she knows what I like to eat. There's been very few meals in my life that just when I'm through eating, I'm just telling her, babe, this is, you are an amazing cook. She is. And don't tell me, but I, I, I need to claim credit for this, but if I ever wear an outfit that looks pretty sharp, just tell me how good it looks, but truthfully, she's the one that picked it out. Yeah. What are you saying, Pastor? He knows what makes us happy. Now, I envision part of heaven and having boats and sea dews and four wheelers. And I envision heaven having a lot of stuff that's that I like. Fast heaven cars. You you haven't heard a real fast car. I don't know about that, but. I just know it's gonna blow our minds. Yes. Amen. There's a story told about a five-year-old boy who will never be forgotten by those who knew him. He was dying of lung cancer, and which is obviously a terrifying disease in its final stages. The lungs filled with fluid. The patient's unable to really breathe good. Terrible, claustrophobic, especially for a little child. And this little boy had a Christian mother who loved him and stayed by his side through his whole ordeal. And she would cradle him on her lap and she would talk softly to him, talk to him about the Lord. And instinctively, the woman was preparing her son for the final hours that she knew was, was, was soon approaching. And a nurse or someone told uh, heard that as she entered the room one day as death was sure approaching and she heard this lad talking about hearing bells and the bells are ringing mommy he would say he would cry out the bells are ringing I can hear them mommy and she she thought the nurse thought he was hallucinating and and she was trying to comfort the mom because he was uh, slowly slipping away and she she left and returned a few minutes later and she heard him again saying, Mommy, I hear, I hear bells ringing. And the nurse said to Mom, Mom, you, you know this baby is, is hallucinating. That, that means that, that time is short. That, that goes along with this, this disease. And the mom pulled her son closer to her chest and smiled and said, No, he's He's not hallucinating. I, I told him when he was frightened, when he couldn't breathe, if he would listen carefully, he could hear the bells of heaven ringing for him. And that's what he's been talking about all day. Amen. Because heaven's shore was near. They were ringing the welcome bells. Here he comes. I don't know about you, but I've lost some dear ones that I love with all of my being. But I tell you, the bells of heaven are ringing. Joe, when it's your time, I've got a place for you. And whatever your name is today, if you're blood-bought, 
Amen. If you're born again of the water and the spirit, there's going to come a time when the bells are going to ring and God is going to welcome you home. Clap your hands with anticipation. We see a lot of construction and heaven has been under construction for a long time. But you'll not get there in your room. You ever been to a, a, a motel, hotel, and another city, and you get there and you say, Sir, I'm sorry, your room is not ready yet. I want to tell you, church, your room will be ready. And it will be fully furnished. No under construction there. Heaven stands at attention to usher him into the place, amen, or her in the place that God has prepared for us. Heaven is resplendent. When the new Jerusalem comes down of heaven to earth, its beauty cannot be compared. A bride adorned for her husband. We have heard about the streets of transparent gold. We have heard and read about the 12 gates of pearl, 12 foundations of precious stones. A little girl was talking uh, an evening, taking an evening walk with her father and uh, she was looking with amazement up to the stars and exclaimed, Daddy, oh Daddy, if the wrong side of heaven is so beautiful, what must the right side look like? The beauty of the heavens are overwhelming, but can you imagine what heaven is going to look like? The song that says how beautiful heaven must be. Sweet home of the happy and free. Fair heaven of rest for the weary. How beautiful heaven must be. Would you dream again? We dream of jobs we dream of things that we want or need, but could you begin to dream again about that sweet home, heaven, mansions, trees, rivers, fountains of water, food, animals, altars, fire, coals, tongues, center, incense, crowns, rainbows, thunderings, lightnings, lamps, a sea of glass, singing, Worship, mountains, doors, posts, precious stones, diamonds, pearls, walls, gates, fruits, trumpets, temple, palm trees, palm trees, innumerable other things. But most important is we'll see Jesus. We'll see Jesus. The creator of this universe, <clears throat> oh, heaven is rapture. By rapture, I don't mean the Lord's appearing for his church, and he will. But that necessary event outside of death that will take us to heaven, I, I'm not really talking about that in this point. I mean rapture in terms of joy, unending joy. I heard a preacher that had an upbringing in Arkansas, a little town there, and his father was a Pentecostal preacher, and, and it was a small little church, a country church, actually, and he said, my dad preached every Sunday morning on hell. He preached every Sunday night on the need for the Holy Ghost, and, and he preached every Wednesday night on heaven. He said some people who attended that church never knew that there was a heaven, Because they didn't go to church on Wednesday. <laughs> Amen. If you missed heaven, you missed it all. You can have the greatest positions, make the most money, have the most friends, have the most likes. Amen. But if you miss heaven, you missed it all. Amen. You ask why? Why do we believe in heaven? An old gospel song that I grew up with that will date me, actually, Andre Crouch. The opening lines goes like this. You may ask me why I serve the Lord. Is it just for heaven's gain or to walk the mighty streets of gold and to hear the angels sing? 
Is it just to drink from the fountain that never runs dry or just live forever, ever in that sweet by and by? But if heaven never was promised to me, neither God's promise to live eternally, it's been worth just having the Lord in my life, living in the world of darkness where he brought me the light. Amen. Amen. So to confine our existence to the here and now is to deny the true existence of heaven. Our citizenship is in heaven. I don't know how many of you have passports, but i got to tell you, there's very few countries you can get in without that passport that's verifying who you are and where you are, and they pull it up on their computer, and they see your whole history. Well, I want to tell you, heaven is recording every day of our life, and I want to make sure that my name is entered in heaven's books. Amen. Our conversations need to be more about heaven. Two things can be found in heaven which brings great joy. First, the absence of all evil. Second, the presence of all good. The absence of evil prevents sorrow. The presence of good brings fullness of joy. It will be rapture to hear the angels sing. Oh, we hear some beautiful singing here. But something about the angels that will be singing, it will be rapture to meet the saints of old. I picture that every so often. I think about that every so often. The many brothers and sisters that, that I've pastored over the years more than I could count today that have gone on to meet their reward. People that we love, but I've got to make my preparation because one day I will be promoted. You will be promoted if you live right. It will be joy, unending joy, to walk the streets of gold, to recline on the golden sands of that celestial shore, and sigh when you see the beauty of the forest in the fall. We sigh when we see the turquoise waters off of a beautiful shore and our beautiful beaches around the world. And we, we almost gasp with the beauty of some sunsets and how incredibly beautiful God has made earth. We sigh when we watch a cloud drift across a tall mountain. Could it be that our soul was saying, I'm really longing for heaven. I look for beautiful things. We explore the wonders of the world, but oh, don't forget to explore the wonders of heaven. John Dunn said, no man ever saw God and lived, and yet I shall not really live till I see God. Randy Alcorn put it, he said, the day I die will be the best day I ever lived. That's a great philosophy, right? Amen, amen. Our minds must be set on heaven, we will be a lot less likely to mess up our lives, a lot less likely to dip into the world of sin when we realize that we are multi billionaires, that we have a heavenly hope and a heavenly home. Amen, amen, amen. J.C. Ryle, Ryle said, I pity the man who never thinks about heaven. And in Colossians 3, Paul commanded us to set our affections on things above and not on things below. Diligently, actively, single-mindedly make heaven your quest. Amen. Seek it. Look for it. Pursue it. Amen. Heaven is more real than anything that you see on planet earth. As children of God, amen, we must look toward our hope. Our hope is in Jesus Christ. As Christian in the Pilgrim's Progress drew near to the heavenly city, he saw the gates open to receive others. He said, I looked in and after them, he says, and behold, the city shone like the sun. The streets were also paved with gold. And in them walked many who had their crowns on their head and palms in their hands and golden harps to sing praises. There were some that had wings and they answered one another without intermission, saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord. And after that they shut up the gates, and which, which when I had seen, 
I wish myself among them. But today it will take more than wishing. We must make our calling and election sure. We must lay hold on the promise of God because he has called us. No man, he said, can come to him unless he calls them. He has called us to walk in his wonderful light. Amen. But pastor, I'm, I'm focused on winning this world. C.S. Lewis said, the Christians who did most for the present world were those who thought most about the next world. The reason modern Christians have been so ineffective in this present world is because they have lost sight, he said, of the world that is to come. Oh, I believe when we get a fresh picture of heaven, we want to make sure that every family member goes there, that every friend goes there, that every passerby goes there. <clears throat> Aim at heaven. Someone else wrote, and you'll get earth thrown in. Aim at earth, and you will get neither. Amen. John 3 and 5, Jesus answered, Verily, verily, or truly, truly, I say unto thee, except a man be born of the water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God, into heaven. Outside of heaven, salvation is the greatest gift that is known to man. Outside of salvation, a person will never find heaven. Before we find heaven, heaven must find us. It is not by might nor power, but it is by his spirit. As I walked in this building last night and I was feeling the presence of God, I prayed that God would touch every person that walks in this place, that they would feel the anointing of God. They would feel the presence of God. They would feel the power of God. Heaven must invade our world. We are too busy we become consumed with our world. The baptism of the Holy Ghost is called the earnest of our inheritance. It's the greatest thing on this side of heaven. It is transforming. There is nothing like receiving his spirit. It's a down payment on the rapture that is to come. It's joy unspeakable and full of glory. It's being filled with some of heaven here. Oh, the amazing thing to see someone that is laden with the burden of sin, of guilt and shame that is on them, strong addiction, strong holds, but watch them walk out of the seat where they are and come and kneel at an old-fashioned altar, and they begin to repent of their sins and say, God, I've been a sinner, and I've strayed from you, and I've not kept your commandments, and I need to tell you that I've done some terrible things, and I want your mercy today, and you'll watch the presence of God sweep over them, and they say, now, Pastor, I want to serve God. I want to be baptized in his name. I want everything he's got. And he said, I will give you the Holy Ghost. I'll transform your life. I'll take out that stony heart and I'll give you a new heart. <laughs> Heaven is in this building. Someone asked the child how he knew that God was there. How do you know that he is there? This child, was using, they were using this child as an example. They said, Johnny, I saw Johnny there holding a string, but I couldn't see what he was holding. The string went up, but nothing there. They said, Johnny, what's up there? He said, that's my kite. He said, how do you know? He said, because I feel the tug on this line. Oh, Jesus is in this place. You may not see him, but he's tugging on you today. Heaven is tugging on someone as the music comes. I've prayed with many people that have received blessings. I prayed with many people that have received their healing. I've seen phenomenal miracles, not me, God. Only an instrument. I've seen him do so many phenomenal things. 
children in trouble, sickness, near death. I've watched God intervene so many, many times. I prayed with people who had great burdens, people that did not want to live anymore, and watched suicide come off of them and hope restored to them. I've seen those that had absolutely no hope left, and I've seen hope restored. Amen. Burdens lifted. But all of this does not compare to praying with someone that receives the glorious gift of the Holy Ghost. There is nothing that compares. Is it? What is it? It's the transformation that happens inside of man. That's where God takes up residence inside. Would you stand with me? Heaven on my mind. Amen. Amen. It's not just a remarkable experience. It's not just speaking in another language or tongues. It's not just that. It's heaven taking residence up in your life. Would you lift your hands and just worship him right now? Because we're in his presence. When we talk about our God, we talk about a place that he has prepared for us. Many of us have given up hope on the tomorrows, but today, as you lift your hands, you're going to find him putting his hand in your hand to bring reassurance to you that you are my child. I paid a high price, but don't allow the things of this world to water down your hope think on me he says today think about eternity the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is dwelling in you the same spirit that reveals to us that God is preparing for us this wonderful place called heaven First Corinthians 15 and 15. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit corruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed. In the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed for well, this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must be put on, put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, O death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin. The strength of sin is the law, but thanks be to God which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. 